Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for the opportunity to share results of some work that we have been doing in Wisconsin. It's, it's, this presentation does a nice job, I think, of, of feeding off of the, a lot of the information that Dre has provided already. Um, but I also want to recognize the biological committee uh, that worked to pull all the data together to uh, essentially develop an assessment model for whitefish. Uh, that includes um, folks from Red Cliff, Bad River, State of Wisconsin, and then I was able to provide some assistance from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So this area is, has a long history of commercial fishing. Um, you can see from this graphic uh, kind of a long-term trends. We had multiple periods of buildup, subsequent decline, the first being due to really uh, sea lamprey invasion and predation. Um, the other interesting period to note is the 1980s where there was this rapid increase in the amount of commercial harvest and then a, just like a drop off completely. And really what that had to do with was not necessarily stock dynamics, but it was a change in really, or actually an effort to try to dampen lake trout mortality. And it's kind of a common theme through this presentation is that though that and even Dre is that the management of lake trout and whitefish are linked together and so by limiting the amount of large mesh effort for lake trout that subsequently limited the whitefish fishery um, but the period that I'll focus on and that our assessment model that we were sort of able to try to look at and assess was really since the late 1990s when that commercial fishery again began to increase so the fishery, as was noted, is uh, it's a large fishery in the Apostle Islands. And considering and thinking about how much of that area is actually a non-take refuge, it's, it's quite amazing. But it's a trap net and gill net fishery. It's both a state and tribal fishery. Um, and as a result, there's a state tribal agreement or have been multiple state tribal agreements in place since the 1980s that really determine a lot of the, the dynamics, the management of the commercial fisheries and the co-stewardship of, of the resource. There are a lot of operators um, in the area, so it is a high concentration. I'll show you what that looks like in terms of, of, of harvest, but it's, it's an area of very high fishing activity. There is also a popular and maybe slightly growing recreational fishery, but it is very small relative to the commercial fishery, about 1% of the commercial harvest. So this, this graphic shows, I think this was 2022, a kind of a spatial representation of harvest across the lake. And uh, this is a common trend where Wisconsin waters, uh, specifically WI2, has the highest level of whitefish harvest across, the, across all of Lake Superior. Uh, more specifically, if we look at the trends kind of uh, after that previous graphic that I showed you, really from the mid 90s forward, see there that was that dramatic increase in harvest of commercial, a commercial harvest of whitefish. That coincided with increasing harvest limits for lake trout. Again, greater opportunity because of lake trout recovery. But then in the middle of the time series around 2010, there was a need to dampen lake trout mortality once again. And so that also had an effect on the available effort for the, the commercial gillnet fishery. And so you see this decline in harvest. It isn't necessarily linked to stock dynamics. It's the dynamics of the fishery that are limiting commercial harvest. So as Dre alluded, there is not a quota system in Wisconsin, but there are a number of different protections, uh, strategies that are both uh, aimed at whitefish, but often more so aimed at lake trout that provide harvest sealing. Uh, there's the protected areas that, that Dre talked about. There's gillnet, if, gillnet limitation that's linked to the, the, t, the quotas that we have for lake trout. And there's also just some of the dynamics of the trap net fishery being relatively short, limited areas where they can go, the depths that they can operate. And so if you, you, know, you look at the last 20 years, uh, harvest has, has fluctuated, but it's a, it's a high level of harvest and yet probably sustainable, or at least we suspect that. We didn't necessarily have a lot of the metrics uh, necessary to evaluate whether or not that was sustainable. Um, certainly in Superior, we, we watched these incredible declines of whitefish in the lower lakes and remain concerned that could something like that be around the corner. And so the more we can understand about the stock dynamics, the current status of whitefish, the better. And Wisconsin was one of the few areas where we hadn't developed a catch at age model uh, to, to try to assess management strategies. So just a really quick uh, summary of catch and age models and their use in the Great Lakes. 
These models incorporate things like harvest and catch rates from surveys, but also most importantly, they have age-specific information that describes the age composition of the, the specific fisheries. That's what sort of sets them apart maybe from other assessment models. They consist of two submodels, one that estimates the stock dynamics, things like mortality, numbers of fish at age, and then the other submodel predicts the, the data that we're feeding it. So it predicts harvest, age compositions data, and, and, the, and the like. We provide summaries of catch, effort, survey CPE, age compositions, length at age, weighted age, and on the back end, we then, it estimates things like numbers of fish at age. We can then convert that to biomass. We can look at age-specific mortality rates, so compartmentalized mortality, so we can understand what portion of the total is due to fishing, natural mortality, sea, sea lamprey. Uh, models like these have been used since really about the mid-1990s uh, and have a long history uh, of use for lake trout and whitefish and other parts of the, of the Great Lakes. So having said that, why has it taken us so long to develop a catch at age model for Wisconsin? Uh, decision makers, managers, uh, negotiators had been asking for this for quite a long time, even going way back to when I still worked with Wisconsin DNR. They were, they were seeking out uh, an assessment model. Quite frankly, though, we didn't necessarily have the long-term data sets necessary. And it isn't so much that we were lacking trends in harvest. That's been monitored for really as long as the fisheries have operated. But what we didn't necessarily have is that age-specific data from the fisheries and also from the surveys. Lake trout rehabilitation, and this is a common theme, theme probably for other agencies, was such, um, took up so much of our time and effort as managers that that time wasn't devoted to collecting aging, aging structures for some of these other species. And only really in the last 20 years or so, we devoted more time towards looking at the, uh, looking at fisheries data uh, age, aging lake whitefish from trap nets and from gill nets. Like I said, we had this long history of, of harvest, but we just didn't understand what that age composition necessarily looked like. And so as we started to work as a biological committee to bring all that data together, really we didn't have consistent age composition from the fisheries or our surveys until about 2004. And so the time series that I'll be presenting is the starting point is 2004, which is a relatively short time period for these assessment models, about 20 years, uh, which really caused maybe some problems that we had with maybe stability of model and convergence. But So because there has been this long history, especially in the 1836 treaty waters, we had assessment models available to us rather than starting from scratch. We really used one of those assessment models as, a, as the base uh, that's the starting point. Those models consider the tra a trap net fishery and, and gill net fishery, but do not necessarily incorporate survey data. Um, what is novel maybe sometimes in, in this particular base model that we used is that we allow age specific selectivity to vary over mean length and age. Selectivity or the vulnerability of different sizes of fish can vary over time. That's all length-based, these are age-based models, and so we really have to account for how vulnerable a particular fish at, is at a specific age to a gear, because if it is absent, we need to understand why that is, whether it's truly absent in the population or if it's because it's not vulnerable to the gears that we're fishing. The other thing that we do is allow catchability, which is the fishing power of any particular gear to vary over time. There's a lot of things that can influence that. The, the level of experience of the fishers that are participating in a fisher, how they come in and out of a fishery can influence the relationship between effort and actual harvest. That's important, that's what we're tracking is that relationship between or effort and harvest. Unfortunately, in Wisconsin, the, the age composition of the fisheries is such that we really don't see whitefish until really age six or seven. Um, that's, that's different than other areas, other fisheries that operate in Lake Superior where often uh, age four or five fish are already vulnerable. And so it was kind of tricky and we had to, with that base model, start at a point where we weren't trying to estimate fish less than age seven, um, which is, that's a large portion of the population that we, we just simply couldn't estimate. So some of those first stabs at developing a catch and age model with that, just using that base information, was that we were getting these, uninf well, really what we thought were not necessarily real uh, trends in, 
in recruitment, right? It's not truly recruitment because it's age seven. That's really the recruitment to the gear and, and really wasn't, we felt like we could try to do better if we tried to incorporate survey data. Um, Lake Whitefish models, at least as they currently stand in other parts of the Great Lakes, actually do not incorporate survey data, fishery independent survey data. And so this was a bit novel to, to see how well we could utilize maybe other surveys conducted in Wisconsin to help uh, strengthen the model. The spring lake trout assessment that's done uh, annually certainly captures whitefish, but when we started to dig into the capture of whitefish, both spatially at certain stations, it's very um, inconsistent. And so the trends that we were seeing from that spring survey really weren't necessarily, we didn't feel were informative. And so we abandoned the idea of using the spring lake trout assessment data, instead looking towards that graded mesh survey, which, which Dre described a bit, which is a multi-mesh survey that's done in July, August timeframe. It was really de designed as a fish community index, and so it has sampling stations in some of those shallower water habitats, and so it captures much, it captures a wider, uh, or provides a broader perspective of the age distribution of, of whitefish in the population. It also captures a lot of young fish, which is really what helped as we incorporated that into the assessment model. And the way that we did incorporate that survey data into the whitefish model was just as, as as is done with lake trout models, uh, where you have catch per effort, an age composition, and then various factors that sort of weight that data relative to the other data sources. Uh, before I jump into really output of the model, I think it's important to look at the commercial fishing sort of dynamics. Um, here is the catch rate for the gill net in the top panel and then trap net on the bottom panel. And what's interesting is you see a very similar pattern at the end of the time series, a consistent pattern of increasing catch rates. Even though I showed you harvest maybe was ticking down, catch rates themselves were actually going up, which would be indicative of maybe some increase in population size. So one of uh, just, I'm not, I won't show you the whole long list of different metrics that come out uh, of the uh, stock assessment model, but certainly looking at biomass, I think is important. The top panel is female spawning stock biomass and the bottom panel is total biomass. And you can see that there has been some variation over time, but largely I would say it's, it, it's fairly stable over the time period. Um, and and all, what is also reflected in that increase in catch rates in, in more recent increase over the last four or five years in biomass as well, both st female spawning stock and total. Uh, if we look at what we are measuring as recruitment, which is the youngest age that we can estimate with the stock assessment model, which is age four, it seems like there's been a bit of a regime change where the first part of the time series was fairly consistently at a certain level of recruitment, it increased and now it's operating at a little higher level and that's probably what's driving some of that more recent increase in biomass as well. It's just increased levels of recruitment. Um, as I was listening to, to Dre's presentation, I think we should go back and kind of look. What we don't have is the context prior to 2004 to see if the biomass early in the time series that I'm presenting wasn't driven by higher levels of recruitment in the 1990s. I, I think that it might be. Um, and I'll, I'll, the reason I say that is when we look at annual mortality rates, um, they are relatively low, lower than what we might see in the same area for lake trout. They're varying anywhere from 28 to 38 percent annual mortality rates um, and fairly consistent over time. There's not a huge, you know, not huge changes in mortality over that same time series. This is really busy, so I apologize, but the point I want to make from this is that these dots represent the, the proportion of catch in the gillnet fishery at each, at each age, and each row is a year. And the point I want to make here is that what we also saw with Dre's information is that there's a high proportion of fish that are surviving well into their teens and even into the 20s. So it's a broad age composition. So it shouldn't be surprising to see that annual mortality rates are relatively low as well. Even though extraction is very high, it seems like that's uh, a reasonable level of, of exploitation given what there seems to be a lot of fish in this, in this area. So definitely consider this preliminary work. I think um, we can always say it would benefit from more data, but I think that truly is the case as we accumulate more data. I think there's more technical things we can do with the model. Um, when I show you 
biomass in the context of other areas of Lake Superior. We, I had a little bit of sticker shock because it, it, it is a very high number. Um, so maybe we, ha we still maybe have to work out some problems with some uh, uh, sort of uh, the scaling issues. But I think generally speaking, we have a, a pretty useful model. Um, incorporating the, the survey data was huge in allowing us to estimate younger fish, but it also brought greater model stability in general. Um, having that another data source with a nice wide age composition, it isn't, doesn't necessarily deal with as many selectivity issues because it's a graded mesh survey. It really was very informative to the model. So when you put estimated biomass from WI2 Apostle Islands region, which is the, the brown area, and all those other shaded areas are from other parts of US waters where we have assessment models, it's a big number. There are a lot of whitefish out in the Apostle Islands. But in the beginning of the time series, it certainly would make some sense. It's close to the same magnitude as what we see in the adjacent units, that, that mustard colored band, which is MI2, MI3, which is those areas in Michigan on the west side of the Keweenaw. Um, but also keep in mind that they're extracting over a million pounds of whitefish every single year. That's two to three times greater than that second highest unit. So again, I, you don't need an assessment model to tell you to, to sustain that level of harvest. There has to be a lot of fish in this area, either coming from somewhere else or, or produced internally. But if you look at the complexity of habitat, um, and really the habitat available for all life stages of whitefish in the Apostle Islands, again, not surprising that the production is very high there. And uh, also interesting, just thinking about that, that old, old age composition, despite high, high levels, high harvest. As we thought about ground truthing, like does this still make sense? Um, we look towards the USGS bottom trawl survey, which really does a nice job of, of sort of uh, tracking, I would say, those younger cohorts of, of Lake Whitefish. The catches in the Apostle Islands, when you look at it regionally, are orders of magnitude higher in that bottom trawl survey in the Apostle Islands than anywhere else in Lake Superior. So it, it certainly makes sense in light of, of that survey that there, this is a, a high, area of high production. Also recently, Dan Ewell at USGS worked with University of Minnesota Duluth in developing a hydroacoustic sampling approach for whitefish. Again, maybe as a way to ground truth what, what we saw coming, which was this assessment model, where they incorporated bottom trawling, midwater trawling, and hydroacoustic sampling to try to get some estimates of biomass that are completely separate of the efforts that I'm describing. And the, the graduate student that was working on that uh, just recently pulled together biomass estimates. And they estimated whitefish biomass in the Apostle Islands to be around 9 million pounds. Um, they, the, the age classes, the, our two techniques, are estimated are not exactly overlapping. But if you look at the SCA estimates, we're talking 10 to 13 million pounds. We're, we're in the ballpark. I mean, we again, we may not have it perfect, but I, at least it's not orders of magnitude different. So as we continue to refine the, the mechanics of the model and potentially even think about one thing I haven't touched on at all and it's relevant to what Dre presented is the dynamics and in the, in the interplay between the refuges. So the data that we used for this assessment model included those partially protected areas but not those no-take refuges. How there is interplay between those, how, you know, if, if fish are, if there's production in the, in those refuges that is supporting the fishery, the more we understand that, I think that'll continue to refine this model. But I think at this point, it still provides us some useful outputs and metrics to help us assess sort of the status and, and trends of the population in the Apostle Islands. So with that, I will stop and answer any questions you might have.